uh, with a really engaging introduction. So this is the kind of thing that I think really engages cognitive scientists. Um, the idea that uh, reasoning is sort of something that can evolve out of face-to-face -face communication and our embodied activity in the world. Um, the particular proof that, uh, the idea behind the proof that she's gonna give, it may actually go back to Pythagoras himself. And you can get the sense of this proof by just sort of having four triangles. Um, the, uh, four triangular tiles that you um, rotate on uh, uh, within a larger square. Um, so the short edge of the triangle is A, the long edge is B, the, and then the hypotenuse is C. And if you rearrange these triangles, um, you can make one area inside of the square that's C squared and what must be the same area out of A squared and B squared. What Hart does is to make this proof by folding, which might not be something that you've ever uh, thought about doing before. Um, but um, origami mathematics is a thing. Um, mathematicians have studied it. And instead of building mathematical objects with a straight edge and compass like Euclid does in his famous elements, um, you can make mathematical objects by folding. And it turns out that it's actually strictly more powerful. Um, so, just as an illustration of this, um, one thing that you can do is, if you have a, a line, you can fold the edges uh, to sort of line up, and what you get is the sort of perpendicular bisector of a piece of paper. Um, so that's the kind of thing that she's going to do to make this sort of math, mathematical construction. And so what she'll wind up doing is wind up folding over four triangles to make that C-squared shape that you saw, and then fold over a couple other tri triangles to make these A-squared and B-squared shapes. But what I'm interested, so it's really amazing that inferences can be sort of grounded in the physical world this way. But what's also particularly interesting for me is the way that people rec recruit language to make it clear how these inferences are unfolding in the world. So let's just watch the proof. Um, So, <laughs> I, I love this. Um, um, what I want to do in, uh, the, in the course of the talk is to 
uh, use this as a jumping off point for some of the research that I've been doing on the kind of organization of conversation. And some of the things that you see here um, are, are sort of challenging for um, maybe the view that you might have gotten from of formal semantics from Montague or uh, from pragmatics from Grice, where you just have sentences uh, and you're understanding their, their truth conditions or the elaborative inferences um, that you ice, ha, add as icing on the cake, as we heard earlier. Um, this is a case of multimodal communication where um, the communication not only exploits gesture, but uh, physical activity in the world. The understanding important ways involves creating, in some sense, using new concepts. You know, if you're learning for the, for thinking of a folding operation as a mathematical operation for the first time, you have to somehow uh, learn, in order to understand this, what the abstractions are that um, allow you to draw an inference by folding. And the language is linking up with those concepts in creative ways. And nevertheless, you want to give an explanation that where the idea that you have as a result of this, seeing this video and understanding it is um, a, you know, a, a proof, a fair way of convincing someone that the Pythagorean theorem is true. Um, so um, uh, these, are, I think, are you know, real challenges. But it turns out, I think, that they're challenges that um, find echoes in the kinds of everyday interactions that, um, that Jonathan was talking about or that Craig talked about earlier this morning. Um, and that if we focus on those everyday interactions, start to look at the mechanisms involved and perhaps build and test computational models, um, we can sort of see that there are, there's linguistic knowledge at play, particularly the kinds of rules for uh, signaling new meanings uh, and uh, reaching a shared understanding that Jonathan was emphasizing in his talk. And also sort of skills for aligning our understandings with each other um, uh, that are contributing to interlocutors' ability to construct and understand uh, presentations of the kind that uh, Hart's uh, using in this video. Um, and uh, an example that I find, find sort of particularly compelling to sort of make that case to bridge between the kind of rich kinds of reasoning that Hart is presenting and the everyday interactions that we have is an example from the work of Herb Clark and his uh, student Meredith Crick, who had people assemble uh, Lego uh, models. One participant was the director and had a plan for the uh, toy that the uh, group was supposed to build. The other participant was the follower who had to fo carry out the instructions to build the piece. And you might have expected people to formulate very precise and careful instructions about what the uh, matcher should do. And you might have expected the matcher to sort of reason carefully about what the interpretation was and carry out those actions precisely. But actually what you see is a kind of interaction, a sort of improvisation, I'll call it, um, where the director gives instructions in installments, um, provisional instructions that get rapidly revised. Well, the matcher, uh, the follower, uh, attempts in provisional ways to show their understanding and carry out the instruction. Um, and what that allows people to do in the space of what this is six seconds of transcript in which the uh, instructor, Susan, is telling uh, where a piece should go by saying, put it so it only covers the last two, not those two, not those two, but yes, those two. And in the meantime, the follower has poised the block at various points along the way. So you have this very quick back and forth with descriptions from the instruction giver that are sort of brief and approximate and um, responses from the uh, matter that are designed to show understanding and keep the conversation on track very quickly in real time. Um, and 
what that suggests is that although we can look at conversation and find reasons, you know, find evidence that lots and lots of different kinds of reasoning is potentially available, we might not want to explain the success of conversation through uh, lots and lots of fancy reasoning, but rather through the interaction of quick mechanisms um, for sort of simple inferences that keep a conversation on track. OK. So, um, one kind of, so what are the kinds of reasoning that you can expect to see in conversation? Um, I think it, it's important to appreciate that it's sort of rich and heterogeneous. We know that there is cooperation and collaboration in conversation. Uh, uh, the example that AI researchers kind of like is uh, sort of collaborative problem solving. This is an example from Martha Pollack's dissertation uh, where the, sister, the user uh, says, I want to talk to Kathy. Can you give me the phone number of St. Eligius? And the system is a cooperative responder that says, no, St. Eligius closed last month, but Kathy was at Boston General. She's already been discharged. You can call her at home. Um, this is, some people find this so cooperative, it's a little creepy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, the system's cooperative in the sense that it's recognizing the meanings that the uh, user is using to express themselves, recognizing the implicit commitments or assumptions that the user is making, like that um, Kathy was at this hospital rather than that one. And the system's also recognizing the uh, user's ultimate goals, like talking to Kathy, uh, so that the system can provide information that fulfills the user's ultimate goals. And of course, to the extent that we want to build sort of helpful you know, robot servants or whatever, this is the kind of reasoning that we want to do. But especially in computer systems, um, there are a lot of problematic interactions that we need to uh, prepare for. So in computer systems, uh, speech recognition is a very faulty operation. Um, so we need to be prepared um, that we might not uh, hear things the way the uh, speaker uh, said them. And this is sort of something that happens in real life, too, as you, this sort of joke says, uh, where um, the second one mishears windy as Wednesday, uh, and the third mishears Thursday as thirsty. Um, that can happen. Um, and of course, when you're having sort of back and forth in conversation, you can often recognize that your interlocutor didn't understand you correctly, which is not necessarily a matter of cooperative reasoning necessarily, it's a matter of coming up with good hypotheses about the uh, noise in the environment and the kind of signal that they might have heard. Um, people are also wrong about meaning a fair amount. Um, so Arnold Zwicky has a, favorite, a famous paper on malapropisms. Uh, Jonathan, of course, presented the pleasant legions, uh, jeopardize here instead of deputize. Um, again, you might think that that's a sort of um, marginal case, um, uh, you know, useful for, uh, that you can sometimes recognize with children or something. Actually, um, I'm going to present some data later about um, color descriptions in a large crowdsourced corpus. And actually, people use a lot of color words in these uh, descriptions um, in ways that don't match up with the dictionary definition, let's put it that way. Um, so again, computer systems also need to be prepared for um, these sort of errors in meaning. There also are cases where people recognize that uh, collaboration is not really the right way to approach this. Uh, so if someone says, someone, I don't know who says, I would make a great president uh, on the campaign, campaign trail, um, actually that's exactly what they would say, whether they would make a great president or not. People are, are quite sensitive to the uh, sort of economic facts about cheap talk that um, when incentives don't align, um, you should ignore what your interlocutor is saying. Um, um, and that's a, sort of an important aspect of reasoning and conversation sometimes. Sort of more subtly, 
Um, there are cases when the uh, interests of interlocutors are just misaligned enough that you can sort of trust them a little bit. <laughs> um, so if the professor, so if you hand in your exam and the professor says, you might want to look at your answer to problem three again, you probably are going to check the whole thing over. Um, and it's a, it's a sort of an annoying but economically defensible partial reveal. Um, you're best, you as the student are best off if the instructor tells you the correct answer. The instructor is best off if you learn. Um, uh, but the instructor can tell you a little less than the right answer to make you do the rest of the work. And you get an outcome that's better for both of you than if the instructor told you nothing, but not as good for you as if the instructor told you everything. So these kinds of um, issues of uh, objectives are important in a sort of strategic uh, perspectives on reasoning and conversation. Um, there also are cases where people like Steven Pinker have argued that uh, you need to be sensitive to uh, the heuristics and biases that have led your speaker to the particular choices that um, they've made. So if, if, if I say, you know, I'm talking to uh, my partner or a friend, I don't have anyone to pick me up at the airport when I get home on Saturday. Um, well, you know, you're saying, please pick me up at the airport, but you're not actually asking. Why wouldn't you ask? Well, one thing that you might, uh, you know, that you might recognize as going on there is a phenom the phenomenon of loss aversion, which I think you probably heard about earlier in the week. Um, uh, if you give people a set of the same sort of economic outcomes, um, like, uh, um, I, I'll give you $2 initially, but then maybe I'll take away 50 cents. Or um, I'll give you a dollar fifty initially, and then maybe I'll give you an extra 50 cents. Everybody prefers the second one. Because <laughs> um, they prefer outcomes that are, uh, they like gains less than they hate losses. And so you can think of this as being relevant to, I don't, so like if you say, please pick me up at the airport, and they say no, that's like uh, getting, getting $2 and having 50 cents taken away. If you say, I don't have anyone to pick me up at the airport, um, that's like starting with $1.50 and then maybe getting that extra bonus when they offer to pick you up. So there are these psychological factors that you can recognize uh, as being influencing the choices that people make in conversation. Um, and in fact, um, sometimes, so, you know, sometimes, you know, the emotions at play in conversation sort of leak as well. Um, so uh, I'm very fond of a book um, by the Harvard uh, Negotiation Project by a, a team led by uh, Douglas Stone. The book is called Difficult Conversations, and it's advice about not saying things like this. Um, uh, so it's obvious where they say the, it's obvious that the meaning of the comment is conveyed in the subtext. What's less obvious is what the meaning is supposed to be. Um, uh, so um, sometimes you can recognize, you know, sort of a lot of times you recognize the emotion, the something about the. Um, not the, uh, not the motivation behind a deliberate choice, but a sort of just a kind of gut reaction that's motivating an utterance. Um, and that can play into your understanding of the conversation. It can be important for communicating effectively. So in particular, um, uh, the advice of difficult conversations, when you hear something like this, just to say, it sounds like you're really upset. Let's talk about how you feel. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's important that sometimes communication isn't the point, in the sense that sometimes, you know, in a humorous conversation, sometimes you just present an utterance not because um, you have particular content in mind, but just because an, an image strikes you as um, entertaining or, um, so in this case, 
uh, Joe's suggestion that aspartame affects your memory sort of allows the humorous uh, image that uh, Vi's problem solving here is actually affected by uh, the ills that she's worrying about. Um, uh, it's a little, this is obnoxious, <laughs> but um, it sort of illustrates this point that you don't necessarily want to interpret all utterances for, um, uh, you know, sort of necessarily being on task. So across, so across all these different cases, you have things like practical problem solving, informing reasoning and conversation, but also causal explanation. How might they have misheard me? Strategic thinking, does this person really have an incentive to give me the information that they purport to be presenting? Psychological empathy, you know, uh, of the lo loss aversion or emotional variety. Or this sort of, you can think of humor as being an example of literary or imagination or artistic expression, which can potentially be invoked even in an everyday conversation. This is the kind of catalog that makes my co-author Ernie Lepore despair of, uh, <laughs> you know, progress in psychology sometimes. Um, and in fact, you know, as a computer scientist, you know you know, one attitude that you could potentially go is the sort of um, uh, AI complete approach is called of trying to build one amazing reasoning model that was able to capture all of these different effects by having, uh, you know, layers and layers of uncertainty and um, uh, um, a range of different potential models of the speaker that were being weighted against each other to come up with a kind of overall estimate of the state of the conversation. But as you might imagine, not only do such models tend to be impossible to build, but they tend to be, um, you know, when we even approximate them, they're very slow and cumbersome to work with. And, you know, I think the insight that comes from looking at conversation of the kind of the data that Herb Clark shows is that a lot of times, rather than reasoning really carefully about the full range of uncertainties and hypotheses that are potentially available in conversation, it's better to just press ahead and let the evidence come in uh, that disambiguates these things later. Um, and so what I want to do in the rest of the talk is give you a flavor for how um, a couple of the models that I've built um, might allow you to ha have sort of simple inferences um, that allow you to push the conversation forward quickly and let the information come in sort of over time that disambiguates these things and leads to these sort of richer interpretations, these sort of richer sort of inferences and reasoning as a kind of product of interaction. Um, and that'll sort of lead us back to um, Weihart's proof. Okay, so here's the simplest conversational strategy. Um, is sort of, in some sense, the only strategy that I think might work in, as tight a loop as what you see in uh, Clark and Crick's uh, Lego experiments. Just say random true things. Um, what I'm going to do is show you that you, you can model this precisely. It fits the, mo fits the data pretty well. Um, and, um, you know, sort of seems promising. So what I did, so what I did with my student Brian McMahon is looked at this data set of uh, color descriptions that Randall Monroe collected. He's an internet superstar who made the comic XKCD, which I recommend to the geeky among you. Uh, and he was able, in the course of two weeks of having a little web survey online, to gather several million uh, free text descriptions of color swatches. Um, Color in general, just so, as some background, is a three-dimensional space. Um, 
The most important dimension is hue, which is the color wheel. And the reason why you have a wheel for colors is because colors summarize the spectral profiles that you get from uh, the cones in the retina. So it's not just a wavelength of light, it's a, which, which is where you see primaries like red, green, and blue, which do correspond to wavelengths. It's also saturated mixtures of colors like yellow, which is a mix of red and green, or magenta, which is a mix of red and blue. And so you get this color wheel by combining different colors together, by different wavelengths together. In addition to that wheel, there's a dimension of saturation from uh, muted colors that are sort of pale or pastel to um, bright colors um, and differences of value that go from uh, dark to light. So here's uh, Monroe, Monroe's visualization of the color categories in his data. We distinguish millions of color values, um, but we typically group them into categories. So you see a big diamond of green up at the top there. Um, some of these color terms have been studied extensively in the cognitive science literature as basic color terms, the monomorphemic uh, um, words that sort of uniquely refer to a color in a language like green and blue and red. These are subject to strong perceptual constraints and strong cross-linguistic universals. But um, when you get a crowdsourced data set, you get lots and lots of other color terms, subordinate categories like teal and magenta, um, named subcategories like lime green and navy blue, modified categories like dark green and light blue, uh, light blue and teal, all these categories show up large enough, frequently enough to be the most common descriptor for particular hue saturation value combinations on this space. And of course there are blends like yellowish green and there's a long tail of distributions. So we, we actually focused on um, something like 800 uh, color terms that we had more than 100 examples of in this data set. Um, and so what, is, what does the data actually look like? So for something like yellow screen, you have this distribution over color patches that say how often people use the term when the patch appeared. And you can see it's, um, uh, it's blurry. Um, they're, they're, um, and, and noisy, and so we need to have a model to abstract this into meanings. I, uh, Brian and I took uh, a model that was actually inspired by vagueness and linguistics, um, where um, the, in some sense, the, this effect here of colors trailing off is a reflection of the vagueness of color categories. Um, so linguistically, linguists model vagueness by assuming that there's a threshold in color space where blue is a range that will take you from the greenest blue to the purplest blue, but um, in a context. But normally we have only partial information about where these boundaries are, either because they're not fixed by the rules of language or because uh, we have differing uh, assumptions about our interloc than our interlocutor does or because um, we're waiting to make the decision until more information comes in. Um, and so we have sort of a probability distribution over categories and context. So our knowledge is going to be something like yellow, yellow green in a context is going to be some window there and the blurring is going to be a reflection of the fact that we're uncertain about where that actually is. But that's not the only thing that could be going on in these things. Uh, choices could involve sort of implicature and theory of mind. Maybe we only call something yellowish green when it's not green and not yellow and that that's going to affect the shape of this curve. curve. Or maybe, um, right? And so we need to, um, uh, you know, potentially we could be worried about this. But to start as a first approximation, let's not worry about it. Let's just assume that people just want to say random true things. What does that really mean? Um, well, it, you have to model it in two parts. One is um, this likelihood, how good does this description fit given the semantics? Um, but another part you have to know is this sort of just what's the frequency of this word? You, 
um, some words are used a lot when they're true. Like yellow, when something's yellow, um, people almost always call it yellow. It was something like 90% of the time. Um, people, you know, yellow, green, and chartreuse turn out to be almost exactly the same color in the sense that if you look at the, the two distributions like this, it's pretty much the same shape in the same place. But people use chartreuse much, much less. Um, so there's just this number that sort of, is this a weird word or a normal word that you just have to add in. Um, so we fit, fit that model and, and get some descriptions for what the meanings are likely to be. And then the question to ask is, you know, how well does that work? How well does that actually describe uh, this? We now have this model that predicts uh, a distribution of responses over this crowdsource data based on the assumptions that people know this uncertain meaning and are sort of sampling from it to give, uh, to say random true things. Um, and um, what you want to, what we want to do is to try to say, is to try to make some alternative models uh, to quantify the effect to which, um, to, you know, to, tr to try to check what we might be missing uh, and whether this model is motivated. In particular, one thing that you might have thought is that, gee, this sort of weird model of linguistics vagueness is too complicated. All you need is prototypes. All you need is that one uh, focal color that's like, let's say, the best prototypical blue, and that's all you're going to need. Um, um, so, um, so um, if prototypes are enough, then the performance of this prototype model should be just as good as this sort of more fancy linguistics model. Um, on the other hand, if, the, if there's evidence in the, corp, in the corpus for this more linguistic notion of uh, categorization, we should sort of find some evidence for it in the performance of the model. Another worry is that, well, Lux is mixing all the implicatures. And what you might expect is that implicatures are going to give a more sophisticated signature to the pattern of responses people give than what this model could provide. So for example, um, you know, one thing that's actually true um, that our model doesn't get, but they were, we were able to find by just sort of looking at the data is that like greenish is sort of the same shape as green, but has a hole in the middle for where the really green stuff is. So if, if those kinds of patterns are common in the data, then if we have a more powerful model that assumes that there's a sort of, that just tries to memorize the data, it'll be able to improve on this simple model that we've learned. Um, so here's what we, what we actually find. The numbers that uh, measuring are the predicted log likelihoods of the data in the corpus. And that's what this is. And this is a meta measure of model fit called the Akaika information criterion, which is just weights for the number of parameters in the model, basically. And so what you see is um, the way to interpret these numbers, these numbers are about all the same. That says that they're all equally good at doing the categorization. So um, if you um, just see a point, a, a prototype model will give you a good guess at what somebody is going to call it. But if you're interpreting and, you, and you, someone says blue, that prototype model is not going to actually give you a good estimate for what the range of colors are likely to be. It's going to say things are too close to the prototypes. And that's why this log likelihood of the data number turns out to be much higher in that Gaussian model. So although, there, although the shape is a prototype, you can't treat categorization as just being close to the prototype. Conversely, like when you look at the histogram model, it does about the same performance in terms of predicting the points, but it uses many, many more parameters. So in order for those parameters to really be giving you value for, for money, if you like, you ought to have seen some improvement here. So what that means is that at least at the coarse scale of all of these words, there's not a lot of evidence that there's something more fine-grained about the subject's decision-making in this particular experiment. So, um, and sort of one kind of cool thing about this is, is just a speaker 
the, the prediction is just people, the speaker checks whether a word is true, then picks randomly among the true ones based on the availability. Conversely, the hearer learns that a word must be true when they see the speaker use it, but they get no additional information about the color because the speaker hasn't tried to pick the best color term or the most precise color term or the most informative color terms. They're just trying to pick any one that was true. And so there's no, there's no implicatures in the setup. The, you, basically, the semantics and the pragmatics are the same, actually, um, which is, uh, again, something that people have been echoing a lot uh, over the course of the last few days. So when you look at, at trying to explain how it is that people are making and coordinating these tight decisions moment by moment, well, one possible explanation, maybe, if this line of modeling is on the right track, is that people are making these quick decisions that are easy to make and easy to interpret by basically using, by basically flipping coins uh, guided by the meanings of utterances. So, so that's a sort of sense in which, uh, in some sense, meaning can be a resource for efficient communication. But we're not just interested in um, using meanings that we already know, we also need to be sort of inventing and creating meanings. That's one of the lessons that we learned from Hart's video. And what makes this happen in part is what I like to call coherence, but which um, I think the other speakers in the, this session have really been talking about as relevance, which is to say when the listener in Clark's experiment is doing things like poising blocks when the um, s follower is offering corrections like not that or um, ac acceptances like yes that there the speakers are making moves that are sort of structured to relate to one another uh, according to a sort of schema or background knowledge that uh, people come into the conversation knowing. And um, what, you know, I think that Craig and Jonathan gave really good examples of how powerful those coherence principles are for reaching the right interpretation and for making sure that people understand each other in conversation. But I want to add to the mix that these principles of, of coherence um, are in some sense, a resource for making meaning in the first place, for sort of instituting new meanings um, betwe between interlo interlocutors in a conversation. So, um, so here, here's a kind of example that I've constructed that um, kind of combines a bunch of points that I want to make. Chris and, Chris and Sandy tidied the living room. They put away the toys, recycled the newspapers, and vacuumed the carpet. Then they started in the kitchen. Um, again, sort of drawing on the intuitions that Craig uh, pre presented in her talk, I think you can pro probably get a reading where the second sentence is understood as an elaboration that spells out the meaning of the first. In other words, the toys were in the living room and they were out and a mess. The newspapers were in the living room, they were out and a mess. Um, the carpet is in the living room and needed to be cleaned. And so when Chris and Sandy tidied the living room, the way that they did that, what they had to do, was these things described in the second sentence. Um, the, and then the discourse connective then sort of allows you to attach that started in the kitchen as a narrative connection of, that says what happened after the living room. And there, and sort of, there's a flow of, you know, what, questions under discussion that hold this discourse together that allow you to track these kinds of connections. Now, what I like to say is that um, it's not just a fact that you put these events together and you see the descriptions next to each other, and that's what lets you know that that there's this elaboration connection. So, if you say Chris and Sandy put away the toys, recycled the newspapers, and vacuumed the carpet they tidied the living room, then they started in the kitchen, somehow you think that that first sentence is describing what they did in their own room before they got to the living room. Um, so even though the content is the same, 
the, you take the order to the content to be rated in different ways when the order is different. Um, uh, so it's not just sort of like the fact that these events could, these descriptions could in principle be related that lets you uh, see this. It's the way that they're put together. And it's not just, it's not just sort of that cooperation dictates that uh, elaborations come after. Um, because you can also get the, the reversed interpretation by just making the relation explicit. So if you say Chris and Sandy put away the toys, recycled the newspapers, and vacuumed the carpet, in other words, they tidied the living room, you get that same interpretation as you had before. It's just um, that you have to signal it. So, um, so what I think, um, and I, I think this you know, may be a point of difference or a point of agreement with a, the previous speakers, uh, or a sort of nuance to explore further and further research, is that, in some sense, you want to include the ki this kind of the possibility of this implicit elaboration relation in this situation and not in the other situations as being one aspect of a, a kind of, of linguistic or communicative competence that is, uh, in some sense, continuous with speakers' linguistic knowledge with the grammar of their language, in fact. OK. Now, this elaboration relation has a really important role, I think, in resolving meaning. So Chris Barker has showed that this helps you to uh, precisify the meaning of vague language. So if you say, Fido's a big dog, he weighs 20 kilos, that elaboration meaning actually tells you that 20 counts as big. So that we're measuring bigness of dogs by weight, and 20 counts. Um, Herb Clark has studied nonce expressions, the sort of uh, invented words in context. And again, elaboration can, tell, can implicitly give definitions for these. So John did a Napoleon. He put his right hand between the buttons of his coat and scowled. Um, in this case, that second sentence is telling you what a Napoleon is. Um, and um, in, many, in some sense, I think that the same thing is happening in um, a lot of cases in Hart's video. The way that she's providing the instructions is telling you, in some sense, what these folds mean or how the folds can be interpreted as mathematics. And, um, uh, that the inference, the reasoning that she's communicating becomes, it becomes much easier to understand how it is that she's tracking uh, or presenting these inferences to an unfamiliar audience by appreciating the structure that hold, holds her utterances together and links them to the ongoing actions. So here's one example that I, I particularly like because it illustrates something that also happens in speech and gesture in it. So it was something that I was um, alerted to kind of before even going into this project. What she says is, fold your square in half one way, then the other way, then across the diagonal. And what she does is this. I mean, what's really interesting about this is um, if you just got the instruction out of the blue without seeing it, it would be pretty confusing. How are there only two ways to fold a square in half, one way and the other? And then what, is, what diagonal is it? Every square has two diagonals. Like, what's going on here? Um, but when you see it, um, it's clear that she's using the shape of the paper to anchor the one way and the other way. And that there, by the time that the folding's done, there's only one fold left that's along the diagonal of the original square. So in a way that's very classic for speech and gesture, um, recognizing that this utterance uh, is a description of the action that accompanies it allows you to resolve a lot of the ambiguities in the language and make the, the language much more uh, underspecified, but still um, 
uh, clue into what she's doing. What's also interesting about this is that she's chosen to use a bunch of vocabulary in describing these operations that actually highlight the mathematical properties that are crucial going forward. In particular, um, she doesn't have to say that you're folding the square in half, but she does because it's going to be important going forward that those lengths are equal. Uh, and so if you're paying attention to that, um, you can remember that the folding oper and, and appreciate that the folding operation actually creates uh, segments in the um, uh, you know sort of in uh, along the paper that um, are in equal correspondence because of the way that they've been constructed, and you can reason from that going forward. Um, uh, Here's another case like this. Sorry, I, I seem to have crashed. I, I, you know, I particularly, you know, there are these cases here where they're also like she's also pointing out aspects of the scene that you might not have appreciated, like the the thing that has the edges of the paper. Um, um, it's interesting. She's again using mathematical terminology here, so that um, this is actually. So I mentioned that in origami mathematics, there are seven kinds of folds. So the a fold that. Um, aligns two lines together to make something parallel. That's a different kind of fold that introduces different mathematical properties. And in particular, it, doesn't, it just creates this perpendicular relationship, but doesn't actually locate that relationship anywhere mathematically along the edge. You're free to put it wherever you want. Um, and there also are utterances that are just comments on a salient situation that allow you to um, that point out, in some sense, inferential relationships that you can draw. Now we're moving up to the square centimeters by um, And I, I don't, um, I forgot to put this on the slide, but there's a great thing at the end of the video, um, which I'll find while we set up the question period, um, where um, she actually tells you, gives you a little uh, parenthetical instructions about how you should be listening to her. Um, uh, uh, what she says is, I'll just say it, mathematicians are rebels and never believe any, anyone unless they can prove it for themselves. So be sure to not believe you when I tell you things like, this is a square. <laughs> um, so um, so what I, I hope to have done today in a suggestive way is to sort of bridge the uh, material that, that Craig and Jonathan talked about and some of my own work with the broader themes of the workshop. In particular, to emphasize that although um, uh, you know, there, are these, there are very rich and flexible kinds of reasoning involved in language understanding and very flexible reasoning that's a product of language understanding, um, involving physical activity, new concepts, um, new meanings, um, that um, we're, we might be able someday, let's say, uh, to explain these kinds of creative language use through 
um, the mechanisms that we have for signaling new meanings and the skills that we have for aligning our understanding moment to moment with one another. And so that although there are um, a sort of terrifying array of considerations that could potentially matter when we're trying to appreciate the mental state of our interlocutor in conversation, um, that understanding often develops through interaction rather than being the starting point for interaction. I think I'll take questions.